With that, I'm going to turn it over to PJ here. Um, PJ is the director of the UW Insect Diagnostic Clinic. So he's sort of Brian's, I guess, insect counterpart. Um, so you can submit samples for identification to him, sort of like you would do with a plant disease to Brian. Uh, you may recognize him from guest appearances on the Larry Mueller Show and also from past uh, First Detector Network webinars and recorded videos. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to PJ here. Thank you, Tony. Well, pleasure to be here today. Uh, what I want to talk about is go fairly in depth into a specific invasive species, gypsy moth. Um, and sometimes when we talk about gypsy moth, it almost feels like we're, we're beating a dead horse because I'll talk about the history. We've actually had this thing around uh, for about 40 years, since the 70s. Um, but we're going to talk about new trends and, and what's going on in the last couple of decades or so. So first, just a little bit of background information about gypsy moth. This is indeed an invasive species. It's not native to North America. It is native to parts of Europe and Asia. Uh, although it has an interesting story behind it, it was actually purposefully brought into the U.S. in the 1860s. We'll talk about that a little bit more later, but it uh, was brought into uh, New England, Medford, Massachusetts. Um, a guy was trying to do some experiments, and it escaped. And for the most part, it has spread westward and southward from there. It's also gone a little bit farther north into parts of Canada, but the bulk of the movement has been to the west and the south. And typically, when we get this insect moving, we tend to get outbreak conditions on the leading edge of the invasion front. That is where we have massive defoliation of uh, wooded areas. Uh, and in terms of the type of insect uh, damage or damage this insect does, uh, we've got the caterpillars down here. Uh, they do have chewing mouth parts which function just like a, a pair of scissors or a pair of pliers. And so if you've got an outbreak, millions of these caterpillars in a small area, they're just going to completely defoliate those trees, uh, which can really stress those trees and perhaps make them more susceptible uh, to attack by other insects or certain diseases. Uh, and just uh, what uh, an idea of what gypsy moth can feed on. Uh, it turns out they can feed on all kinds of things, uh, ranging from trees to shrubs. They have certain uh, species like oaks that they uh, strongly prefer, um, and that's one of their favorite things to feed on. Although if you think of our wooded areas and forests in the state, we also have a lot of aspens uh, and wet areas. We've got a lot of willows. Uh, in urban areas, apples and crab apples can be very common. Uh, birch out in the woods, and also basswoods, lindens, and the like. Both common in uh, wooded areas, but in urban areas too. So all these can be fed on very easily by gypsy moth caterpillars. There are certain plants that gypsy moth doesn't like to feed on as much, although um, if you force them to feed on it, they still would in most cases. So things like maples, walnuts, um, gypsy moth can technically feed on certain conifers, uh, like fir trees and, and spruce trees and the like doesn't happen that often, but again, they can feed on a very, very wide range of things and also things like hackberry, ironwood, cottonwood, and the like. And so overall, gypsy moth caterpillars can feed on over 300 different types of plants. And if we take a step back and look at kind of the, the overall bigger picture, what are the impacts of something like gypsy moth? I mentioned before we can get this uh, periodic and, and very extensive defoliation in some cases. And if we look at this picture down here, this is just an example of a situation where a forested area has been really completely defoliated in that spot. Now, if the trees are generally healthy, they're going to put out another batch of leaves and they may be OK. But if this happens again and again, that's going to weaken those trees, make them more susceptible to other insects. Uh, and possibly some disease pathogens. We also get reductions in tree growth. If you have trees that uh, are getting stripped of their leaves and have to spend energy each year to put out another batch of leaves, um, they're just not going to grow as much, put as much wood on. And so if you are growing trees up north for, uh, say, use in a paper mill for paper production, that's going to be a concern for you or for other logging products. And overall, uh, it's going to be hard to kind of measure and quantify this, but some potential shifts in forest food webs. If we have caterpillars that are uh, eating all the leaves off the trees, well, what are the native caterpillars supposed to feed on? So uh, again, there's a lot of kind of big picture things that gypsy moth can do. And just a quick review of how do we identify gypsy moth. Um, well, easiest life stage to identify, and this is the life stage that does the damage, are the caterpillars shown down here. Uh, when they are mature, they can get up to about two inches long. Uh, 
Um, they are kind of grayish and very fuzzy in appearance and they have a series of these nodules on the body. They're actually these physical bumps that stick up. Um, they've got a bunch of, of red ones and they've got some blue ones up towards the head. This would be the head uh, right there, uh, kind of that lighter area. So those are the caterpillars. Um, we'll talk about general life cycle in a moment, but again, that's the life stage that is feeding and causing damage. Uh, and then here's the other life stages. We've got the adult moths. We've got a female. Uh, and she is light colored, kind of whitish and pale, whereas the males are kind of a darker beige to brown. In some cases, they may be almost blackish in color. And then one other thing to point out right here, uh, egg masses. And we'll talk a bit more about egg masses in a bit, because the egg masses are really one of the reasons why this can be such an invasive pest to deal with. And in terms of the life cycle, if we went out into the woods today looking for signs of gypsy moth, this is what we could potentially find. The egg masses are uh, very fuzzy uh, in appearance. They have a felt-like uh, texture to them, um, and these egg masses can be about an inch or two long. Um, so these are the egg masses in spring, depending on the temperature. Um, they will hatch, we'll get our caterpillars. Typically, this is going to occur in uh, early May, roughly, although this year, because of El Nino and a, a quick start to the spring, uh, we may have some gypsy moth caterpillars out in April. But these caterpillars are going to feed for several weeks, a, a good month or so. Eventually in June or perhaps early July, they are going to become pupae. This is kind of that uh, intermediate cocoon-like stage. Uh, and then we're going to get the adult moths in July or into August. Those adults then mate uh, and lay eggs and we start the cycle again. So there's only one generation per year for this insect. Now the, the key point that makes this species so darn invasive are the egg masses, uh, which again are shown here. They're beige in color uh, or, or light colored, and they have a very fuzzy, felt-like appearance to them. Um, it turns out that when the females lay egg masses, um, she really kind of follows that strategy of, of putting all her eggs in one basket. Um, it turns out that the female gypsy moths aren't capable of flying, and so they just kind of walk to a suitable location, uh, lay her egg mass. That egg mass may very easily contain 500, 600 eggs, maybe even up to 1,000 eggs. And so this is one of the classic examples of why we have billboards saying don't move firewood, because if you've got firewood with an egg mass on it, you're not just moving a few caterpillars. You could be moving 1,000 caterpillars. Well, that could potentially be a whole new infestation. And so uh, all of these life stages, and especially the eggs, can be moved on things like firewood, um, logs, uh, Christmas trees potentially, um, and also in some cases automobiles. If you have had a, a trailer that's been sitting around for a while, I'll show you a picture in a second, but you could have egg masses on the underside. And so again, this is just showing the, the females, uh, the light colored moths laying their eggs, and that, again that egg mass can be about an inch or so long. Uh, maybe up to two inches long. And again, these females can't fly. So if you were to think of an invasive species uh, that has a female insect that really can't move very far, you would expect that that species wouldn't be able to move across the country very well um, because the females are one that's laying eggs. But uh, the human movement of these egg masses can be a major concern for us. And here's just a, a picture, an example of the underside of a vehicle that sat for a long time, was used very infrequently, and we can see that there are a number of egg masses on the underside of this truck. Um, there are a couple of female moths. I see one, two, three there. Uh, so if someone were to move this truck or trailer, um, that could potentially be six to maybe 8,000 gypsy moth eggs. So again, you're not moving a few caterpillars. You're moving an entire population of these insects uh, if you're moving firewood or other materials. So a brief note about the history, because I mentioned before I kind of dangled that uh, out in front of you, that this insect was actually purposefully brought into the country, which seems kind of weird. Why would someone purposefully bring in invasive species? Well, at the time, we didn't know it was invasive. Um, there was a guy by the name of Trugolo. Uh, in the 1860s, he brought gypsy moths uh, to the U.S. He was studying silkworm caterpillars and he was hoping to breed uh, a hardier version of a silkworm, silkworm caterpillar to make silk and make money off of that. Uh, well, he had these caterpillars in his yard. They escaped. 
um, in the late 1860s, uh, and then by the 1880s. So there was about a 10 to 12 to maybe a 15 year lag uh, before we had our first outbreak situation um, of gypsy moth. And this again was in Medford, Massachusetts. And then the rest is history. You know, this is kind of the, the situation gypsy moth uh, went across the country from there. So what did the expansion actually look like? Well, again, we had our first outbreak in New England in the uh, 1880s. And this is what it looked like in 1900, our map. We didn't have very much spread from gypsy moth, uh, but then by 1915, we get some spread northward a little bit into places such as Maine. Uh, but then things are actually fairly quiet. Look at 1915 to 1965. That's 50 years, and we really didn't have a whole lot of spread from this insect. Uh, and then things change a little bit. We get to year like 1981, uh, and we have additional spread in New England, places like New York, uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. But then we have this population pop up in Michigan. Um, and so again, we can have movement of firewood with eggs on it or other materials, and that's always a concern. By the early 1990s, um, basically all of lower Michigan had gypsy moth in it, uh, and then that leaves us to about the year 2000 where we had the, our first cases of defoliation going on uh, in the state of Wisconsin. And one point I want to bring up is uh, something we have in ecology called the Ali effect. And basically what this means is that um, an organism needs a certain number, a kind of a critical mass in order to to really take off and have it, its numbers uh, increase in the population. So if I back up just a second, um, if we looked at this map from 1900, uh, you know, there's very few gypsy moth there uh, present at that time. They need to build up numbers so that the males and females can physically find each other. And so with that said, uh, with this Ali effect, if there are too few of the insects present in an area, um, their population shown by this black arrow will actually go down and they may go locally extinct, but if they get up to a certain point, a critical threshold, then they can take off. Uh, kind of the analogy that I um, would say, if this were, excuse me, if this were uh, a war movie, uh, you know, World War II or something like that, you got guys uh, landing on a beach. If you send three soldiers onto the beach, they're not going to establish a beachhead. You need that critical mass present uh, before they can kind of gain momentum and take off. So that's where the uh, Ali effect takes in here. Now the history of gypsy moth in Wisconsin. Uh, we actually had our first detection in the state uh, in the early 1970s. But what's interesting, we didn't have our first problems in the state uh, until a couple decades later. It wasn't until 1997 that we had our first major defoliation event, about two acres in Oconto County. Now remember, again, we got that Ali effect. So very few individuals uh, were present in the state in the 1970s. Males couldn't find females to mate. Or in some of those cases, it might have been males which can fly. They got blown in long distances. Well, if there's no females around, we're not going to have any eggs being laid. So we had our first defoliation, 1997. Uh, and then by 2001, we were having some issues. And that's the year we first started doing some aerial spraying with things such as a BT, a bacterial, uh, product used to control gypsy moth. And just to give you an example, uh, you know, these things were making headlines. This is from uh, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel uh, in May of 1979. So that's, you know, almost uh, a good 40 years ago, we started hearing about gypsy moth in the state. So this is something that's been around a long time, uh, and it's also going to be with us for many, many decades to come. And I showed this in a smaller version earlier, but this is what the gypsy moth distribution looked like right around the year 2000. So we had it in Wisconsin at this point, just in the very eastern edge uh, of the state, right along Lake Michigan. And then here's some patterns that we saw from about the last 15 years or so. Um, so we get a, a peak in some decent populations in 2002, 2003, uh, and then in 2003, uh, where this red arrow is, we had uh, conditions that favored predators uh, and things like diseases, which can pop up and be very significant. And so we see then by the year 2004, uh, and these numbers here, these are acres uh, of forested areas that were defoliated. So we went from 65,000 acres down to 20. Um, and then in 2004, 2005, 2006, 
uh, we had a couple years where we have rainy conditions that were very favorable for diseases which kill off gypsy moth and so their numbers remained low. We also had tied in with their um, some spraying to control gypsy moth. And then around 2007, 2008, we have some decent numbers of acres that were defoliated. The interesting trend here is in the year 2010, we had massive defoliation by gypsy moth in the state, uh, about 347,000 acres. If you do the math, that comes out to about 500 square miles. So that would be a few walked in one direction 23 miles, made a right turn, walked another 23 miles, and made that a square. That's how much area was defoliated by gypsy moth. So that is a very, very large amount of area. Luckily, though, um, also in the area we had significant disease outbreak. And so those populations crashed in 2011 um, due to things like diseases, but also strategic spraying to control gypsy moth. We didn't have any acres defoliated by gypsy moth in 2011. Um, 2012, 2013, we had uh, some moderate defoliation, about 14 to, or 12,000 acres. And the last few years, in 2014 and 2015, gypsy moth has been pretty quiet. We have had very few acres uh, defoliated by gypsy moth. So that's a pattern we've seen in the last few years. I've got a quick question to, um, from the from the audience, are the photos and illustrations that you're using, can they find those, can the can people find those? Most of these, yes. Um, there is a number of gypsy moth websites out there. Um, UW Extension has a gypsy moth website. Uh, both the DNR and DATCAP have gypsy moth websites that a lot of these figures can be found at. Uh, for this current figure on this slide with this line chart, um, I actually created this, but all of this information is uh, currently publicly available. The DNR Forestry Group puts out annual reports and they talk about gypsy moth and uh, you know oak wilt and all kinds of, of issues going on in our forest. Um, and they have the records available and annual reports from uh, 2015 back to 2002. So if you just uh, did a Google search for uh, Wisconsin DNR annual forestry reports, you should be able to find those pretty easily. That's how I got the data present on this particular slide. Uh, so how does that last slide tie in with this? Well, this is kind of a, a, a theoretical explanation of what goes on. So uh, we may have gypsy moth population present at, at very low numbers, and there are a number of predators and, and parasites, diseases like fungi that keep them in check. But if conditions are good, um, temperature, um, rainfall, precipitation is low, for example, then at a certain point, the population takes off and we get this major outbreak, we'll get very significant defoliation. Eventually though, um, we get things like competition for food and resources and basically starvation occurs, um, but also disease can pop up and be very dramatic, which sends the population crashing back down. So we can go through some of these long-term population cycles with insects such as gypsy moth. And we've seen that from that last slide over about the last 15 years. And so what are some of the things that feed on gypsy moth? Uh, there are insect predators like ground beetles that will actually crawl up into the trees and feed on the caterpillars. There are tiny parasitic wasps that will attack the egg masses. And there are some other creatures like birds uh, that will feed on the caterpillars. Uh, and then mice actually will feed on the pupae as a, a food source in some cases during the winter months because, uh, I'm sorry, during the, the summer months. We just got those uh, pupae sitting around. Uh, and one other factor that uh, can be fairly significant, uh, there is a fungus. Uh, although unlike uh, some of the diseases Brian talked about, this is a beneficial fungus, Entomophaga myomyga. Um, it is native to portions of Japan. And remember, um, gypsy moth is native to parts of Europe uh, as well as parts of Asia. Uh, so scientists identified this fungus in parts of Japan and they said, seems to kill gypsy moth pretty well. Let's bring it over to the U.S. and see what happens. Well, they tried a couple times to introduce it. Um, the first time was back in the early 1900s, about 1910, 1911. Um, didn't seem to work then. They tried it again uh, mid-80s, 1985, 1986. Uh, but overall, they didn't see any dramatic impacts of these. And so they kind of uh, threw their arms up in the air and just said, this stuff doesn't seem to be working. Well, a few years down the road, 1989, uh, they started finding infected gypsy moth caterpillars. And at this point, this disease has kind of spread around many parts of the country and established itself. Um, it can do uh, 
very well and act very dramatically under specific conditions. And being a fungus, uh, this disease favors damp conditions. So often what will happen if we get a rainy spring, um, when those gypsy moth caterpillars are active, um, this disease can pop up and almost kill off and crash those populations within the span of a few days if the conditions are right. So what's the current status in the state? Uh, well, as I mentioned with that line chart, um, gypsy moth activity has really been pretty low uh, the last two years in 2014, 2015, uh, where we have seen activity lately. And this is a, a current quarantine map of the state. Uh, but most of the activity we've seen in the past few years has been south central Wisconsin, so places like Walworth County, Brock County, Dane County. Uh, there also has been, have been a few reports of activity scattered from about uh, Columbia County up towards Wood County, so in this portion of the state. So again, it's often along the leading edge of the invasion front where we get the major outbreaks. Uh, at the moment, there are currently 15 counties quarantined for gypsy moth. Um, and if you're curious, what does that mean? It basically says if you have some kind of product that you are planning to sell and ship throughout the state, it could be firewood, lumber, Christmas trees, uh, you can't ship it from the red quarantine counties uh, to the non-quarantine counties unless they have been inspected and are insured to be gypsy moth free. Uh, and tying in with this, we actually have some programs in place in the state to help deal with gypsy moth. Um, so those counties in red on the last slide shown here uh, in green, this is the infested zone. These are areas in the state where we know that gypsy moth is here. It's been around a while. And these, again, are the quarantine counties. And the DNR has a suppression program in place. Uh, and what that program does, if there are certain hot spots that are identified, uh, the DNR can uh, help kind of deal with those situations. Um, in the non-quarantine counties, we have a transition zone where we're just outside of that invasion front, we might be getting these little pockets of gypsy moth popping up. Um, and we have a program in place called the Slow the Spread Program, run by Department of, of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection. And basically what they are doing is making targeted applications at these small pockets to hopefully slow down that spread so that it doesn't get uh, to the western part of Wisconsin as quickly, doesn't get to Minnesota uh, and Iowa and other locations as quickly. And just to tie in with these monitoring programs, now how do we monitor for the gypsy moth? Well, there are actually these pheromone traps out there. So if you're ever driving down the road and you see these uh, traps hanging in trees that look something like this, um, they use these for gypsy moth. And they can use them for other species, too. It all depends on the pheromone lure that you put in them. Uh, but these traps are placed out in the spring, and they're checked during the summer. Um, the Department of Ag will then look at that trap data um, and look at potential hot spots where they collected a lot of uh, moths in the traps, and then go back and look for egg masses in the fall. So about October, November, the Department of Ag is out there looking for egg masses. If they find lots of egg masses in a given area, that gives them a heads up that that may be a hot spot the, giving, or the following year. And so they can use that information and data to help coordinate these aerial spraying efforts to uh, control gypsy moth on a large scale. And what do they use to help control gypsy moth on a large scale? There's a few different types of things out there. Probably the number one thing used, uh, aerial applications of a product called Foray. Um, this is a bacterial-based product. Uh, it contains Bacillus thuringiensis and the strain is Kerstaki. Um, this is very specific to caterpillars. Um, and so it can be sprayed over large forested areas from aircraft. Um, and it will do a very good job of controlling gypsy moth and preventing large-scale defoliation. There is also another product out there uh, containing a virus, which is highly, highly specific to gypsy moth and gypsy moth alone. So if we have a situation where we know there may be gypsy moth in an area, but we're also concerned about something such as blue car or carnivore blue butterflies as an example, well, we could spray this product from aircraft chip check. Um, it contains a virus. Uh, it only affects gypsy moth. So the gypsy moth will ingest those viral particles when they land on leaves. Uh, and then the caterpillars themselves basically turn into a bag of liquid. They die and just kind of hang off of the plants there. So if you're ever out in the woods and you see caterpillars just hanging limp uh, from the side of a tree or from twigs, uh, most likely they've either come down with this virus or uh, been affected by uh, some other disease. There are also, in some cases, uh, mating disruption, which has been used in the state. 
if you think of it like this, if we went to the Gypsy Moth Singles Bar um, and sprayed the Gypsy Moth perfume all over the place, the males aren't going to be able to find the females. And so that has been used strategically uh, in some cases. So that wraps up uh, my section about Gypsy Moth. Are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, if not, um, I do have a, a few other slides, just some other insects to kind of keep an eye out for in 2016, which I'll go through rather quickly. Uh, if you want my contact information, though, it's all available here. Um, my email, Twitter handle, if anyone is on Twitter, uh, and also my lab uh, website address.